Hello, this is Dr. Kevin Kirby coming to you from Northern California. Today's lecture will again be on biomechanics terminology for the modern podiatrist. This lecture is going to be on stress, strain, and an introduction of the concepts of tissue stress. Stress is basically the ability of an object to resist deformation and to develop an internal loading force or resistance to loading forces to avoid that deformation. Here we see a tension force being applied to an object. And here's the cross-sectional area of the object. And stress is measured not as a, just a force, but a force acting over a unit of cross-sectional area of the material. And this is gonna be denoted as sigma. In other words, stress is force over a cross-sectional area, and it is measured in pascals, or newtons per square meter. There's two main types of stress. There's axial stresses. Typical types of axial stresses are going to be a compression stress, where the compression force is acting along the long axis of the object. Other type of axial force could be a tension stress, where a tension force tending to pull or elongate this object is going to be parallel to the long axis of the object. Shear stress, however, is going to be that stress that resists the sliding movement of the parallel layers of the material. So here we have a shear stress within the uh, object where the two layers are tending to resist being pulled apart and that is going to be its internal resistance to deformation or a shear stress. So there are five main types of stress. There's tension stress as we've already mentioned. Here we have a object trying to be pulled apart and elongated and it is resisting with a tension stress. Here we have a compression stress where an object is attempting to be pushed together so that it is shorter. Here we have a torsional stress where a object is being twisted and it's resistant to twisting is a torsional stress. Shear stress is going to be an internal resistance to avoid sliding of one layer of the object relative to the other. And bending stress is that stress developed within an object as it is attempted to be bent into a different shape. As we talked in our other lecture about pressure, it must be remembered that both stress and pressure are measured as a force over an area. Stress, however, is developed as a force over a cross-sectional area, whereas pressure is going to be an applied force over a surface area. So larger stresses, so we have a larger force here in a smaller area. This is going to cause a higher stress. And in pressure, if we have a larger amount of force over a smaller surface area, this is going to cause a higher pressure. Both stress and pressure are measured in pascals or newtons per square meter. Understanding stress and strain and tissue stress are important to us as podiatrists since excessive stress is the main cause of the mechanically related disorders we see as podiatrists every day in our clinics. Examples of a compression stress causing an injury may be a degenerative joint disease at the dorsal aspects of the first metatarsophone joint in hallux limitus and hallux rigidus. Tension stress is a common cause of posterior tibial and Achilles tendonitis. Torsional stress can cause spiral fractures of the tibia or metatarsals. Shear stress can cause skin blisters or even ulcerations of the plantar skin. And bending stress is a common cause of long bone fractures, such as in the metatarsals and the tibia. A specific example, which is very appropriate in discussing the treatment of mechanical disorders of the foot, is that for posterior tibial tendonitis or posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. As I mentioned before, tension over cross sectional area gives us our stress. So if we have a tendon that already has a tear in it, it's going to greatly increase the stress within that section of the tendon where the tear has occurred. So here's my drawing here. Here's the posterior tibial tendon with a tension force pulling upwards and a tension force pulling downwards. In the areas of the tendon where there's no injury, the white area here, its normal cross section area will have a normal amount of tendon stress. However, if there's already a small section that has been torn, Due to the decreased surface area in this torn area, it is going to greatly increase the stress, which is going to lead the torn area of the tendon to be the area that's most likely to tear since it has the highest stresses. 
In fact, if 50% of a tendon is torn, this will increase the tension within that area of torn tendon, which is only half its normal thickness to double of what it would have been in the normal areas of tendon thickness. Stress also comes into play when we talk about the compression and tension forces acting across a long bone when forces are applied either along its long axis or offset from its long axis. An axial load is that set of forces that is going to be applied directly across the central axis of a long object, such as a tibia or a metatarsal, and this will cause a minimum of tension and compression stress on the sides of this object. However, if we move the force and offset it away from the central axis, we will call it then an eccentric axial loading force, which is then going to cause increased tension stress on one side that tends to be more convex and a compression stress on that side of the object, which tends to be more concave. And these are these eccentric axial loading forces are one of the main types of reasons that bones will tend to bend because the forces are not being directly aligned across that object and along its long or its central axis. So bending moments cause excessive tending, tension and compression stress along the sides of that object internally as that object tends to resist those bending moments acting on it. When ground interaction force acts on the metatarsal head, the metatarsal will resist that deformation by developing a compression stress on the dorsal aspect since it is tending to be made more concave by the ground interaction force and more tension stress on the plantar aspect of the metatarsal shaft since it is tending to be less concave. If we have a metatarsal that is thicker, it is going to have less stress because it's greater cross central area than a metatarsal that is thinner. And this is why a lot of metatarsal stress fractures occur at the metatarsal neck because that is the smallest cross central area. So this is the area where the largest stresses are, will occur that will tend to cause a metatarsal stress fracture to occur, especially in those patients doing excessive weight bearing activities or have a low bone density, uh, such as osteopenia or osteoporosis. When we start talking about stress, we have to think about this idea of tissue stress, which has become much more prominent now over the past 25 years. Tom McPoyle and Gary Hunt first coined the phrase uh, tissue stress in 1995 in this classic paper uh, published in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy. Myself and Eric Fuller have published a number of papers in addition to a book chapter on the idea of tissue stress where the goal of tissue stress is listed as reducing the pathological loading forces on the injured structural components of the foot lower extremity to optimize gait function and to prevent any other pathologies or symptoms from occurring. The main goal of foot orthosis therapy should be using these three goals of the tissue stress model. Now let's get a little bit to strain. Strain is a little easier to understand, but it's also a dimensionless quantity. So the amount of strain or epsilon is the amount of deformation that will occur in an object when it's subjective to an external loading force. So in this example of a firm foam block, 100 centimeters long on the left, and a soft foam block here, 100 centimeters long also, when I apply a set external loading force on the firm block, and it goes from 100 centimeters to 98 centimeters, the strain is gonna be the amount of length that it had changed, which is two centimeters over 100, or the strain would be 0.02. But in the soft foam block, since it has shortened by 20 centimeters, its strain will be 0.2, since it'll be 20 centimeters over 100 centimeters, or its original starting length. So strain is a dimensionless number, and it basically measures the amount that the object is either lengthening or deforming or shortening to an applied tension or compression load acting on that object. So what are common examples of how we use strain in measuring deformations of the structural components of the foot and lower extremity? Well, strain gauge is a very commonly used type of instrument. It is basically going to be measuring the deformations of a tendon or a bone. Here's an example of a strain gauge placed in the tibia uh, with Aaron Ward and his colleagues' research. 
where he's taken a transducer that is applied to the bone and can actually measure the elongation or shortening of the bone that occurs under load. These type of strain gauges are commonly used to measure changes in ligament, tendon, bone, or cartilage under different experimental conditions because it's difficult to measure force within the body, but much easier to measure strain. And then from those calculations, we can estimate the forces. One of the items that are used in the experimental laboratories to measure these stresses and strains are what are called materials testing machines. So these biological materials we have in our body, where there's tendons or ligaments or bone or cartilage or even skin, they can be placed into this materials test machine. And for example, in an Achilles tendon graft, we can go ahead and pull on this with a clamp attached to each end, measure the amount of force, and deduce from that the stress and the strain of that material. We can also use various surgical implants in materials testing machines in order to determine which construct of surgical fixation is the strongest by using these materials testing machines. When we have this ligament and tendon placed into a materials testing machine, we can come up with something we call the stress strain curve. We look at the strain on the bottom, that is gonna be on the X axis, that tells us the deformation of the material. The stress is on the Y axis tells us the force over cross-sectional area, and the slope anywhere along this curve is going to be the stiffness. So a more vertical axis is going to give us a stiffer material and a lower inclinated axis will be a less stiff material. When we start testing these materials such as ligament, tendon, cartilage, or bone, we see that typically what will happen is that as a material is stretched, it becomes more, develops more force or more stress, and then when it's relaxed, it will come back to its original shape. That means it's functioning within its linear region or the elastic range. In other words, this is an elastic deformation. So at low loads, our body's tissues, including the bone, ligament, tendon, muscle, cartilage, all tend to act at low loads in an elastic range so that they come back to their original shape when it is unloaded. However, if we place too much load or place the load on too fast, we start getting into this plastic range where the, as we apply the load to the ligament or tendon or bone, it goes up in this linear region, then it starts to curve and become more and more deformed with less and less load to the point where it may rupture or in bone it may fracture. And so this plastic range is the range where tendon ruptures occur, partial tears of tendons, ligament partial or complete tears, bone stress fractures, pre-stress fractures, or frank fractures occur in this area of a plastic range. So our goal is to keep our body's materials into this elastic range where there's low loads and try to avoid this plastic range. And this is, forms the basis of this tissue stress model that our goal with any treatment, whether it's orthosis or stretching or braces or what have you, is we're trying to keep the tissues that are injured in this elastic range so they can heal and try to avoid this plastic range where injury occurs. So as an example of this elastic versus plastic deformation, if we apply a rigid block to a foam block and it embeds within it and comes back to a shape, this is an elastic deformation. But if this rigid block comes down into this block and deforms it, that is going to be a plastic deformation. So here's a small amount of plastic deformation and here's a larger amount of plastic deformation. So this gives us an idea of what we mean by elastic and plastic deformations in the tissues of our body under load and why it's so important to have elastic deformation occurring versus the high loads that occur that cause injury and plastic deformation to our tissues. So in summary, the idea of stress and strain and this tissue stress model are important for us to understand because it allows us to understand how injuries occur and how we as podiatrists and foot health professionals can best use things like orthotics or stretching or bracing or surgery even in order to reduce injury to the foot and lower extremity. Remember the stress is going to be the applied force that is divided by the cross-sectional area and it's going to be measured in pascals. Strain is a dimensionless quantity that is going to be the amount of deformation 
divided by the original start and length of the material, high amounts of tissue stress cause the injuries that we see on a daily basis, whether it's a Achilles tendon tear or a metatarsal stress fracture, for example. We want the tissues of the body to be functioning in this elastic range so that no injuries occur, and we want to try to prevent the stresses going into the plastic range where we have these injuries. So it's important that we understand this stress strain behavior and also that stress strain curve I showed you so that we can get a better idea of how the tissues of our body function, how we can best prevent them from getting into that range and how we can best treat these patients that have these injuries where there are plastic deformations of their tissues such as tendon tears or ligament tears or, or metatarsal uh, fractures and, and such injuries so that we can understand better how to treat them as podiatrists and food health professionals. I appreciate you listening. Hope it's been helpful for you and stay safe and healthy. Thank you.